Okay, I, I'm a little bit still hyped up. <laughs> it I was amazing. So, I feel hot, actually. Uh, my back feels hot. My legs feel hot. My arms yeah. feel hot. Uh, if you don't know, um, I guess tomorrow our uh, yeah. a bonus episode will come out, and it will be me in the cold plunge. What a sight to see. Did I make it three minutes? I guess oh. you'll have to see. That's right. Uh, we won't ruin it here. Yeah. Got to tune in. <laughs> Pretty amazing yeah. stuff. I will say some water splashed out when I submerged. Just a little. <laughs> Just a little that bit. That was the more... That's, that's where I almost started laughing. I was like trying to <laughs> t- trying to keep my breath I, <sighs> uh, while that's he was great. talking. Uh, but I was also like laughing at all the water that went out. I, I think only the water only got up to Mike. Where? Right at my chest, like right, right at chest. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think you yeah. were maybe a little bit higher. Yeah, but normally like maybe close to my collarbone, but wasn't going to happen. I thought for first time that's good enough, and I don't, you know, your water bill. I don't want you to have to fill up that. Uh, <laughs> Looking cold out for too me. Much. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it, Michael. Um, yeah, I'm impressed. Handled that well. Um, I don't want to call anyone out. Yeah, I, I will because <laughs> I have seen videos of a couple of other people's first time cold plunge, and my <laughs> goal was if I can do this better than Clayton and Caleb. I win. That's a dub Boom. for me. And by all reports, wow, it was better than Clayton, Clayton and, and Caleb. So. That is amazing. Be sure to check that out. Um, purpose of the cold plunge in parts is your body supposed to have this dopamine response, give you this feel good feeling. And we look at this text that we'll be talking about, this 24th sermon in Romans. It, it should make us feel good, although there are tough things in there. The overall message is a very yeah. positive one. And if I'm talking a little bit faster than I normally do on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast, it may be because of that adrenaline rush. But yeah, that's it's all good. I say we take this to the next level. From the hearts of the low country in South Carolina. It's the Take Two podcast where we take theology to the next level. All right, Romans 8, 28 through 30, we were right. There are going to be uh, at least three more Called sermons in, in Romans 8. So, uh, yeah, so so that's good. Um, probably a familiar passage to yeah. if you're in the body of Christ. If you're outside yeah. the body of Christ, probably John 3.16 or Philippians uh, 4.13 oh, yeah. Classics. are your, uh, you're probably the, maybe the ones you, you know. And maybe uh, Matthew 7.1, uh, do not judge. Uh, just just People, that, just those words <laughs> no more context just just those words uh, that's good but you're right 828 specifically man yeah. everyone loves to to say that verse and, and really for good reason as we're going to see pastor Jill's sermon title is suffering with the confidence god is for us and i think that's like what you got to keep in mind mm. as we navigate that that god is for us who who could be against us that's what's going to come at the end of, of this. We won't cover that today, but that's like what we should be thinking about the Spirit's work mm-hmm. um, because, you know, th- this is one of those uh, passages where people can get bent out of shape. Yeah, and speaking of suffering, we just talked about creation yeah. groaning, us groaning, yeah. in, and then the Spirit groaning on our, our behalf, and then we're going to say, we're, we come into today's text, and uh, to start us off, Joel talks about Paul and Silas when they're in the, the jail. Uh, I mean, all they had done was cast a demon out of a, a girl. Seems pretty harmless to me. Uh, but uh, I guess some people lost their money. They were in mm-hmm. with the local law enforcement, throw them into to jail after being whipped. And, uh, you know, what they do is they start trying to get a lawyer they're pretty mad. <laughs> right. They they're, are they're angry. yelling. No, no. Well, they start singing psalms and hymns, which is kind of counterintuitive, but man, what a witness to wow. to them and around. And of course, we know how the story ends. Mm. You know, the they're they're broken free, but they don't run. And the jailer, uh, you know, hit a court, you know, from this testimony, he and his whole whole household come to wow. faith in Christ. Yeah, and you asked yourself the question, you should be asking yourself this question is how's that possible how can they do that how do believers across the globe rejoice when they're faced with some pretty Mm -hmm. pretty terrible pretty tough persecution and i'm going to say this so you remind me michael but hold on to that paul and silas analogy because i want to revisit it at the end too yeah 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 all right um so like we talked about with the section that we just referenced romans 8 28 paul will say for i consider that the sufferings and there are sufferings he's not saying there's not sufferings 
but that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy worthy that's a huge word it's all we'll comparison talk about, yeah yeah we're not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us and um we get this song it will be worth it all i was you know i was kind of singing that song getting into the cold plunge water like <laughs> i guess it'll, it'll be worth, it'll it, be worth it all <laughs> at the end uh, um and that, so that's good yeah go ahead um and like, and like you mentioned everyone's grown everything's grown and creation's yeah. grown and we're growing even the holy spirit groans in a, in a, in a different way but he's groaning um on our, our behalf of a little bit. It's a good question to ask, how, how does he mm-hmm. grow? And, and really the passage we're looking at today, it's kind of an answer to the Holy Spirit's prayer. I thought that was a right. very insightful connection that Joel made. Yeah, I thought that was, was very good. And if you are in, I mean, you're probably a Christian if you're listening to this mm-hmm. podcast. If you're not, welcome in and listening. But you've probably heard this verse that we referenced at the very beginning of the podcast, this verse. And it may have been used something like this. I lost my mm. job. Oh, well, Romans 8, 28. Yep. God's going to give you a better job. Right. And God may give you a better job, yeah. or he may not. That's not the point of this verse, because the point of this verse is ultimately what we're going to see is our conformance to the image of God's son. So Romans eight twenty eight, the very first part of it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. And we could say, you know, just leave it like that. But Paul doesn't leave it like that. He gives two different qualifications for that. So he's going to limit mm. this, how he works for yeah, good. It's, it's good to keep reading yeah, yeah. so you know what that means because it's easy. Like you said, I should get a better job then. Right. I right. should get all these things because that's good for me. Right, right. And it's to those who love God, that's the first qualification, and to those who are called according to his purpose. So Joel is going to talk about really – the good that God's mm. going to bring about, and then He's going to spend the really the rest of His time talking about these qualifications. That that is great. Keeping this big picture mindset as we work our way through the this text. So let's talk about about the good that we know that God causes all things to work together for good. We know this. We've got full knowledge. Um, he does a great job of you know looking at some of the original languages, looking at the Greek. That it's a past action, but it has ongoing mm. results. Good distinction is, you know, it's not how you feel in the moment, but right. something you know to be a reality, a truth that we can kind of cling on to in, in times of trouble. Yeah, and um, it just happens to coincide, like Tim was teaching earlier about how our feelings, Yeah, and we, we haven't recorded that podcast, but it's coming, <laughs> but how our feelings, they're there, but they should be instructed by what we know, what we believe, how we act, you know, what we can read from Scripture they're, and they're not our ultimate guide. We should be helping to instruct our feelings. And so this knowledge that God is working good on our behalf should help us when we're in the midst of trials and tri- tribulations that, man, I feel like everything's falling apart, but I know mm. that God is working this for good. How is he working? We don't always mm-hmm. know how he's doing it, but we can trust the promises from his scripture. And, and I think on our end, what that implies is you kind of need to know the promises. You kind of mm-hmm. need to be in scripture so you can, you know, quote unquote, you're not holding God accountable mm-hmm. to his word, but you kind of are. He's going to yeah, yeah. see the completion of his word mm-hmm. and visiting these promises. That That's a good place to be. We need to be revisiting where we know God is sovereign, that he's um, working all things for good. This text is a great one. And as you kind of go throughout scripture, file some of those away for when your feelings don't line up with, uh, with scripture. You can kind of get them back, get them back on track. Um, he mentions this idea of synergy. Yeah. Where when things are working together, it's actually more powerful mm-hmm. than the individual parts. Right. Yep. And, and so that's the good. Now let's talk about yeah. the first qualification. The first qualification is fairly straightforward to those who love God. And here's a quote by uh, Douglas Moo. Mm. Is it Douglas Moo? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All I have is D Moo here. But um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it says, loving God is therefore a qualification for the enjoyment of the promise of this verse but is a qualification met by all who belong to Christ. In other words, Paul does not intend to suggest that the promise that all things work for good ceases to have the validity for a Christian who is not loving God enough. Loving God sums up the basic inner direction of all Christians, but Mm. only Christians. Yeah, That's really comforting because I think you could read this and say, okay, God's working stuff together for good, but I need to love him more. We all do need to love him more, but it's not conditional based on your work. It's conditional based on Christ's work. If right. you're in Christ, 
you, you meet this qualification. That that helps me out at where I can latch on to this promise and, and read it for what it is. No, that's good. And um, second qualification is where we start getting Whew. into some potentially – uh, controversial, although we don't see it as controversial. The Pretty clear, straightforward. Clear as day. Clear, <laughs> clear as day. Um, but the second qualification is to those who are called according to his purpose. And we're going to give some um, illustrations mm. that Joel gave of how this kind of works in practice. But then really the rest of this podcast is going to be given over to this second qualification. Like what does it mean? to be called according to his purpose. Yeah, that's a pretty big question. Yeah. If you're going to understand this passage, who is called, what are the purposes? Let's see what verses 29 and 30 tell us. Um, but first, like you said, let's look at some scriptural characters. Joseph, very prominent, takes up mm. a lot of text in Genesis. Yeah, a lot. Um, not Exodus. Not, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, Did I just say Exodus? No, no, okay, no, okay, no, gotcha. no, no. I don't want to call anyone out, <laughs> oh, but see. someone was referencing, and I can see how you yeah. could start referencing Exodus, but Exodus really takes over with Moses. So That's, uh, Genesis is closing out with this huge, long count of Joseph. A lot, a lot of stuff goes on. He's betrayed. He's sold into slavery. He goes to Egypt. He's sold again, well, sold by his brothers and then sold again, running with Potiphar's wife. He's in prison for, if you're doing the math, 13 years. Yeah. It's not like he was hanging out there for a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, he, he rises uh, to, to power in Pharaoh's kingdom. When we get to this climatic verse, really instructive verse, a good paradigm to see things through, Genesis 50, two verses, 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive because his brothers were kind of nervous they're like right. oh man dad's dead yeah you're gonna come for us now yep 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 but joseph rightly seeing god's hand in all of this and how god worked everything for the good of both joseph and for the his people and then in, in that case you, you know joseph kind of sees mm. it we don't always get to see it but that's just the Old Testament. There's no New yeah. Testament example. So I'm yeah, like, oh. I would say there's other Old Testament ones, but Joseph's probably the biggest great. Old Testament, and Jesus is probably the biggest New Testament. Um, Jesus knew no sin. Mm -hmm. He was sinless, but he suffered greatly. Probably the worst way to die. Um, and, you know, just Whew. basically tortured to death while people sit and, and watch you. Um, but it, w it was just a big accident, right? <laughs> right. No. That, that would be a wrong way <laughs> right. to think about it. And if yeah. you had questions about it, I think like what you're about to read, yeah. Peter kind of sets the record straight. Right. Peter, in his sermon in Acts 2, part of it towards the end, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Wow. I think this verse really does a good job of showing God's yeah. you know, sovereignty his foreknowledge, his predestination of this act, but man's free will and man's responsibility. God predetermined it, but these godless men Man. nailed him to a cross. That, that, that's so good. And in this passage, we're going to see very similar language as far as predetermined, predestined, and foreknowledge, because I think, you know, some people will make the argument on the foreknowledge side of things, but th this says predetermined plan mm -hmm. of God in addition yeah. to the foreknowledge, right. where it's like, man, God had this plan a long time ago, but like you said, these people were the means that nailed mm -hmm. Christ to a cross and they're held accountable for that where somehow both of these things are going on. Um, Pastor Joel uses this illustration yeah, by and, Marshall Shelley. Yeah, and this is the one I was thinking of. I was, I was trying to reference the other day. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, Zach may may not be able to relate to this because you don't read fictional books very often, right? <laughs> oh, right um, yeah. that, that we reference. Uh, uh, but yeah, so... Uh, you. Ever, I, well, I was going to say all of us, everyone, most of us have read a fictional book where things just seem messy at first. And uh, here is what uh, Marshall Shelley says about that. Even as a child, I loved to read, and I quickly learned that I would most likely be confused during the opening chapters of a novel. 
New characters were introduced. Disparate, seemingly random events took place. Subplots were com complicated and didn't seem to make any sense in relation to the main plot. But I learned to keep reading. Why? Because you know that the author, if he, is, he or she is good, will weave all of them together by the end of the book. Man, Frodo, just... You, know, you can you can now see my heart see strings that. are tugged. <laughs> Eventually, each element will be meaningful. At times, such faith has to be a conscious choice. Even when I can't explain why a chromosomal abnormality developed in my son, which prevents him from living on Earth more than two minutes, even when I can't fathom why our daughter has to endure two years of severe and profound retardation and continual seizures. I choose to trust that before the book closes, the author will make things clear. So this guy clearly arguing from the lesser to the greater. You know, we oh, yeah. read in books where things are, are wrong, things are going disarray, but you know, the authors, they fix it up. And this guy experienced some huge tragedy in his life, had two kids with mm. birth defects, um, one of them dying instantly, one of them kind of suffering for two years. And it's tempting to end that go, oh, why? What's going on? Why? Yeah. Um, but we know, we can trust this verse that God is going to use that for good. Love that so much. So that brings us to verses 29 and 30. I'll read those. And these really answer the question, who does God call? The who, and then the what? What's the purpose of God's call? Um, we'll get into it here. Verse 29, Paul writes, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What many have uh, monikered, the golden chain of mm -hmm. salvation. Yep. Um, great. I, I was just gonna say, I, I was just gonna <laughs> say that um, anytime you see this, and you can just, it, it's easy to verify, but anytime you see this word, mm. um, uh, foreknowledge and it's paired with God the Father because it happens a couple times outside God the Father but you can just get a good concordance look up all the places that it occurs and God the Father is there the object of that foreknowledge is people he knows yeah. people from before time began and uh, so that's probably this that's that's part of what we're going to be talking about is how does this foreknowledge work um, he foreknew Joel tells us that is a Greek word uh Prognoso, prono, prognosis. Uh, I was gonna kind of give us a, 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 a written out, but I forgot. But uh, but it just means um, that it's for loved, that he knows people, um, and we have a note here from Ventura that says that God foreknew, not merely foresaw, that such ones would put their faith in Christ. And if you look at other uh, places like John ten, it's like he foreknew mm. us, yeah. and gave us to the Son. Uh, and it says, um, and then in response to this, God decided to choose them for it is certainly true that God foresees faith. He foresees all that comes to pass, but rather Paul says whom the father foreknew or more literally knew in advance, knew from eternity or forechose or foreloved so that this knowledge characterizes an intimate personal relationship. That, that's so key. And I would encourage everyone to go do that word study. Um, we did it in impact when we went through Romans. I have our little sheet pulled up here. And even when you look at the word no, most of the time when it's in relation to another human, even not even God the Father, it's an intimate relationship. We know that, you know, Joseph knew Mary. That's a very intimate relationship. Right. Um, we read in John 17, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God. So to have eternal life, you need to not just know who God is. It's not just a knowledge, but it's intimate. If anyone loves God, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, he is known by God. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If you say I know him, but you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. I could go on and on. There, it's overwhelming. Right. But your point stands that that, that really gives us insight to what this means. It's not just this knowledge. It's this intimate knowledge of those who he chose and those who he loves. Right. And so what, we're, what you might hear us guarding against is this idea that is it's kind of out there that uh, in some circles that kind of God just foresees this fact that, you know, Michael will trust him. And so it's on that basis that um, I'm predestined. And we're saying that's not the case, that God in a way that we really can't understand before I existed on my timeline from eternity, 
God mm. knew who I was and chose me even though I was sinful. So that's the first link in that chain. Uh, he foreknew us. And then he chooses to predestine us, which is another Greek, Greek word. I'll let you pronounce this one. <laughs> uh, Michael, uh, appreciate it. Pro uh, eretz. Pro or pro, something like or, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Has this idea of choosing, has this idea, what, what many have termed election, something mm-hmm. we'll try to flesh out a little bit more. I mean, I think most people know when they hear predestined, some people shudder against that because it is yeah. such a strong word. Yeah, and like Paul, uh, Paul Joel's um, admonishment to us that if you believe the Bible, mm-hmm. you have to believe in election and predestination. Like you can't get yeah. around those because they're there. Now there are some options, some that we think are more aligned with Scripture, and some that we think are less aligned with Scripture on how to deal with those words. But you can't just That's throw so those words out. Like you got to deal with them. Yeah, the Bible spe- explicitly says that that God chose us. So you you can say, okay, He chose us, predestined us. You really have to ask the question on what basis. Right. And when you frame it that way, mm-hmm. to me it seems clear because if you're basing stuff on works, that's kind of scary. Well, it's because I'm so much better than everyone else. <laughs> right, right. It's like <laughs> it's man. like that's a scary thing to say. And, and I don't think people really believe that. Mm-hmm. I think it's inconsistency because. I know these people, some of these people, mm-hmm. and it's, you know, but it's like, if you start thinking through the logic of it, I think he framed it really well. What's the basis? But anyway, mm-hmm. that predestined, um, the next part of the chain is called those, uh, we kind of talked a lot about called in previous episodes, right. kind of, and the different, you know, connotations, what, what that means. Um, in this case, it's not like, you know, what's God calling me to do? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's this <clears throat> definite call, right? Right. Yep. And uh, if you're called, then he's going to justify you. And Paul has spent literally mm. chapters talking yeah. about what is true justification. And uh, then the result of that ultimately is this glorification. We, some, we see some of that here on earth, like as we're being sanctified. Yeah, that's good. But ultimately, that answer is going to happen when we are we get our new new bodies. We're resurrected. We have our uh, new bodies and we see him face to face. We see that glorification. And, and I love this chain, you know, we're zooming out. It's this, it's this glorious chain where if you hit one of these, you hit all of these yeah. or if you, or you hit none of them. Right. right. So it gives you confidence that if you're justified, mm-hmm. this whole chain applies to you zooming out again, you know, we can suffer. We can rejoice because of this. This is a positive mm-hmm. thing. So as we take a deep breath and get into election, There are the two views you kind of given us a Mm -hmm. little bit of background going into it. But the first view is this foreknowledge view that he looked down the quarters of time. Right. And he saw you would respond, saw you would Mm -hmm. do these things, and and you were chosen based on that. And and that ultimately, I mean, I know that some people don't like to categorize it like that. But ultimately, if that is the correct view, then we are the difference makers. So God is really looking down and... He is seeing people who choose him. And so the difference is in how they respond to God. And so some had say, would say that God calls everyone and then some respond. And in a sense, God, there is a general call that goes out to everyone. Like, you know, scripture is available to nearly everyone. Um, you know, yeah, that's the, where it gets a little bit money. Yeah. It goes out to everyone. There is a you know, a grace that God gives to everyone, but we're talking about this particular call that um, we see. And, you know, there's so many verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that would mm. say it's by grace through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God so that no one may boast because if I can boast, yeah. then, I, then I was a difference maker. But if I'm not the difference maker, then I, then I can't boast in that. And, and kind of like I was mentioning earlier, I think most of our brothers and sisters on that more semi-Pelagian, Arminian kind of area, I think they would say Ephesians 2, 8, 9, amen. Yeah. I agree with that. So yeah. to me, it's a little bit logically consistent, but I don't want to characterize them as saying like, they don't believe in grace. Right. Because I think they do. Yeah. But I, I just don't see how we're not making the connection. But I want to be charitable in that too. E- yes. Yeah. And and like we said in our Arkansas podcast, when we kind of talked about some about this, uh, when I, you know, I try to understand exactly what others believe sometimes, and and I don't. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so the other option. So that's option one. Yeah. And the other option is that there is a sovereign grace, and that God knows us personally because He's chosen us. Um, and so, um, 
and and there's lots of scripture that lines up with that. Did you have uh, where you turned to one of them? Um, I'm tr- turning something for for later on okay. down the road. All right, you're prepping. So I'll just read these. So Ephesians two one through two says, and you were dead, dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I heard you pause that dead a couple times. Are you making a point? (laughs) Yes. Like we're dead. Like we're spiritually dead. We are unable to do anything that pleases God from there. Um, And then, you know, verse four would go on, would say, but God, not, Mm. not, but Michael figured it out. Not, but Zach, you know, you know, looked up and, you know, it's, but God had mercy on us and, because of his great love for us, made us alive with, with him in Christ. Yeah. I try to compare it to other New Testament examples. This is different, but Lazarus mm-hmm. being raised from the dead, he wasn't doing a whole lot. No. I mean, he, he was very dependent right. on being raised from the dead. Um, maybe a better example is, you know, Paul, Saul, maybe on the mm-hmm. way to the road on Damascus. Um, he was trying to murder, cr- take Christians to jail. He mm-hmm. was anti-God. And God changed his heart. It's yeah. not that Saul was like, oh, I love, I, I'm about to kill some Christians, right. but I actually love God. It, right. it seems like there was a change mm-hmm. with his interaction yeah. with God. You know, I think a lot, I think R.C. Sproul, he would look at a passage like John 3 with Nicodemus and say, you know, you, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again, mm-hmm. that you're dead. You need that regeneration. Mm-hmm. And then then we can come to faith yeah. kind, of, yeah. kind of idea. Yeah. Um, but anyway... Keep on running down. We got some good passages. All right, and Romans three ten. I mean, it's these are quotes, and there's there's more here. So you, you can go back to Romans three and, and kind of go through <laughs> right, all of yeah. it. Uh, but this is kind of highlight. Uh, these are quotes from the Old Testament, as is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Wow, it, it, these are really some of the verse first verses that kind of slapped me across the face mm. when someone said, "Do you did you seek God?" And I was like, well, "I, I kind of kind of feel like I did." Well, like, what does this verse say? And like, oh, well, <laughs> maybe I didn't. And and it's not that I didn't have a response. Yep, it's yep. not that We're I not didn't. Saying, that's a good yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, Great yeah. point. Uh, but my response when when we zoom out and we look at it was because of God's choosing me to begin with and his working in my life and putting me through some tough times, helping me see my sin, opening my eyes at, Whoa, I'm not good. I deserve to go to hell. All of that was by his grace. Yeah. I, I think RC Sproul does some of the best work on these short 20 minute lectures going through what some have termed the five points of Calvinism tulip or something like that. It's really succinct and, and he nails it so well. And what, what he would say, he's actually got a, a funny quote. He's on a panel and someone's like, what do we do with those who say they're four-point Calvinist? And he's like, I'll tell you, I got a good name for four-point Calvinist, Arminians, because they don't get it. And, and his yeah. point is, if you truly understand total depravity, mm-hmm. all these others fall behind it, that yeah. you, you can do no good. Your mm-hmm. heart is sinful, desperately wicked, who can know mm-hmm. it, that you're not going to do that based on your nature. And if you get that part of it right, because I think a lot of people mm-hmm. would say, oh, I get total depravity, yeah. then uh, everything else would, would mm-hmm. fall into play. So I, I recommend looking there um, as well. Uh, Pastor Joel mentioned John 6, 44 to 45 and 60 to 63 that, that talks about that those who were drawn come to Christ. And I like that word. And you can't, I don't think you can base everything off of word studies, but if you go in Blue Letter Bible, mm-hmm. you look up that word drawn. It's usually, it's used often when the disciples are drawing fish out of the water. So are the fish wanting to get in the boat? Probably not. And then kind of doing this callback to Paul and Silas in Acts 16, if I can find my spot here. Um, But when her owners, talking about that demon-possessed girl, saw that their hope of gain was gone, they couldn't make money, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the, the rulers. That dragged is draw, and they weren't like, Hey, Paul and Silas, come over here. Hey, <laughs> hey, this is so enticing. Let me tell you how good it is. Make right. this decision. They took them yeah. and dragged them. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's a slam dunk argument, but I think the preponderance of all of these mm-hmm. verses, it means something. Yep, yep. And uh, you know, there, it's just, to me, you can be reading a passage and there will be just this little bloop of, uh, it, you know, they didn't come to, to Christ because it wasn't permitted of them. Like the, there's like these little B pieces right. that are, that are spread throughout the new Testament. 
Uh, God has chosen, but that is foolishness to the natural man. So if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, Paul is really addressing, you know, some really craziness in um, the Corinthian church. And, uh, you know, they had set up these factions and he wanted to say, you know, I didn't come to you with all these wise sayings. Yeah. I came to you, you know, humble and a servant and I preach to you the gospel, which is foolishness. But if we read through these um, verses, you'll see a re- repeated phrase. Maybe I'll try to, to <laughs> highlight like it. it. But it says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen mm. the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. That is an amazing verse. And it says, or passage says it a few times that the whole goal of that is to give God glory. Yeah. It's like you have beat this drum, but it's like, yeah, who. Who is the one that should deserve mm-hmm. glory in, in this kind of situation? Who's doing the work ultimately? And I know you guys said it in that that podcast. Go in, if you go down all those different five points, I think that mm-hmm. that's the question. Does God have a definite people that he saves? Mm-hmm. Or is it like he's throwing salvation out there and just hoping for the best, crossing his right. fingers, maybe right. people will, you know, yeah. come come to him. Um, Pastor Joel does this illustration talking about another Calvinist, Prince of Preachers, uh, Charles Spurgeon, because I think a lot of Baptists like Charles Spurgeon, yeah, yeah. even if they're not on the Calvinist side. Right, yeah. um, and he's interacting with some Methodists, which I think as a general rule are mm-hmm. not going to be on that sovereign grace side. It seems like the sermon's going really well. A yeah. lot of amens, yeah. a lot of hallelujahs. Then they get to the topic of election, right? Yeah. And this is where I kind of forget the illustration, so I'm hoping you can, you can pick it up from here. Yeah, he was just saying that uh, all of these amens, like he was just walking them down, like kind of step by step, notch by notch, t- t- through this idea of election. And he at the end, he basically says, the Lord made the difference. And they said, yes, amen, we agree to that, and that the, he was the difference maker. And he's like, well, if you believe that, then you we're believe the in team. election. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're all we're all uh, doing the same thing. So that that that's great. So to take a step back, kind of think about this golden chain. These words are in the past tense. Yeah. Um. That that that's significant. These these have happened. Right. They they've been accomplished. Gives us great hope, and really allows us to suffer mm. or to rejoice in the midst of suffering. It's mm. not meant to divide, as it's been done over and over again. And I think we can agree. Um, on a lot of this stuff, but it, election, I think, is something important to, to think about. Um, he's got this quote here, that our verses are intended to give us confidence, to give us encouragement in our sufferings, that God is working in them for our good, and he will ultimately bring to completion what he has begun, that we have a God who has a plan, and he's going to see it through, and if you fit on that you know, golden chain of redemption, you can take great hope, no matter what happens, because you know God is working things for your good peeking ahead, if God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah, and uh, Joel closes with this uh, illustration of this guy whose cell phone password was for us or pro nobis. And they're like, what, you know, what, <laughs> what, what does pro nobis mean? He's like, well, that means for us. And it's like, if, like you said, if God's for us, and it doesn't really matter in the end, we know that uh, everything's going to be okay. And this quote from Ventura is important to know that Paul does not say here that all things in and of themselves are good. We understand Mm. that there are evils. We understand that people genuinely suffer at the hands of evil people or at the hands of calamity of this, this universe. Um, They're not all good in and of themselves. That's not the case. Death is not good. Murder is not good. Mm. Rape is not good. Abortion is not good. Consequently, In view of such bad things, we should be sensitive not to unsympathetically quote this verse to others, especially in their time of grief. The verse is true, and so is Romans 12, 15, which tells us that we are to weep with those who weep. 
And I'm reminded, you know, William Lane Craig, William, uh, uh, Gr- William Lane Craig, Greg Kokel, and others who deal with the problem of evil a lot. Mm. Um, sometimes they'll make the distinction between the intellectual and the emotional problem of evil. Because sometimes people are going through a tough time. Yeah. And maybe you need to get eventually to the intellectual problem of evil and how God has solved it. But sometimes they just need, you know, some emotional comforting during that time. Yeah. Yeah. That that's an important distinction. And I think this is one area where Calvinists get a bad rap because it's so intellectual or it's so mm-hmm. just academic that you can be saying truths that are, are not going to like, because they're not sensitive. You're not doing that weeping with those who weep. And on some level, even if you know all the right verses and you know God is sovereign and man's responsible, mm-hmm. you still don't know how that interface is totally. There right. is mystery there. Right. We can affirm truths and say, hey, I don't know how God mm-hmm. works it out. I know my God is a good God. I know he's a just God. He's a righteous God. He's a merciful God. And I think that's important because if you're, you know, pastorally counseling someone, it it's not it doesn't really mm-hmm. help just to coldly say things and walk away. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so out of this... Um, passage we had we started off home groups Hmm. and uh, had a probably our our most robust discussion in in a long time and part of that is you know you're talking with folks who see this from scripture but they have lost loved ones that they've prayed for that they've shared the gospel with and it's like that they're just not responding and it's like how do i how do i have hope when i have a dad who is up in the years We've shared the gospel with him. He would say he's a believer, but there's no fruit, and he doesn't really want to talk about it. And, and honestly, I didn't want to say this, but like that was a red flag because mm. when I would told you I was a believer, but I wasn't, yeah. and there was a sermon or a lesson on the gospel, I'd be like, oh, I don't want to talk about this again. Mm. Let's, let's talk you know, now. I talk about it all the time because yeah. it's like, you know, this is my story. This is my song. Uh, you know, singing my Savior all the day long type of thing. I'm, I'm going to be I Pastor, like, yeah. Pastor Joel like, before yeah, too long. Yeah, keep it going. <laughs> um, and, you, and maybe you have some some thoughts you can add. Like, always continue to pray. Like yeah. That may sound simple. It may sound like the cop-out answer. But we believe prayer is effective. And we are praying to the God of eternity. Yeah. Like, the God of eternity knows if I'm going to pray tonight. And he knew from his mm-hmm. eternal stance how I'm going to pray and how he is going to answer that. Sometimes it's going to be no. Sometimes it's going to be yes. Sometimes it's going to be maybe later. But he is going to hear that, and he is going to answer it. And uh, so praying is one of those things. And I think, I mean, I take encouragement. We've talked about it. But to go back, I when I look at Scripture and I see that Saul, who hated God, God chose him. That That's comforting, mm-hmm. knowing it's not like this set of, it's not in them that it's going to happen. It's like, you know, God, God can work this out. He's worked it out in people who are very hostile yeah. against him. I think there is some comfort in that. Even though you look at that, you can be, you can not see the comfort. I think there is that comforting yeah. side, encouraging yeah. side as well. Yeah. And sometimes like, you know, it's scary to, to pray to God, whatever it takes. Yeah. I want this. But really, if, you know, that may be the prayer that we need to be asking mm. for our loved ones. Like whatever it takes, if it takes some tragedy in my father's life for him to wake up and see the goodness of your son and the sin in his life, then maybe that's, that's how we pray. Um, sometimes it can be tough to share the gospel with a loved one, yeah. especially if you've already shared it. Yeah. It, you know, it, it can kind of create a barrier. Pray that God would bring mm-hmm. someone into their lives that, you know, would get to know them would be, you know, on that side that can um, help them see things and, you know, keep being that salt and light. I think that's good. Prayer plus action. It's like, man, um, whatever's in you to help introduce them to a resource or someone else or, you know, keep, keep at it. Cause I think that is a discouraging thing, but I, I, I think, you know, zooming out again, the purpose of this passage is, is for hope. And so mm-hmm. we pray, pray to pray to that end. Yeah. Anything else you want to say, Zach? I think we covered a lot, big, big topic. Um, but that's all I got. All right. That's, that's our it. take. Thanks for listening to take two. Find us wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube for those who want to watch our video cast.